Greece. Magic in philosophical garb. Let us not boast, lest some evil eye should put to flight the word which I am going to speak. Plato. Phaedo. More than other nations of antiquity, the Greeks relied on inductive reasoning which framed poetically the somber images of mythology and pervaded their philosophy. Natural phenomena were approached from the higher realms of the mind, which was thought to partake of the divine. This explains why the Greeks were poor experimenters. Despite their masterly logic, they evolved only vague and unscientific explanations for happenings in nature. Mind subjugated matter. This negligence and even abhorrence of experimentation resulted from indulgence in what was superior, the unreserved acceptance of the authority of reason which could exist without material proof. The West inherited this unscientific procedure from Hellenic philosophy. Throughout the Middle Ages, during the Renaissance, and even in more recent times, the natural sciences were hampered by this tradition. Plato says that there are four species of beings, those of the air, the birds, those of water, the fishes, those of earth, the pedestrians, and those of the heavens, the stars, whose element is fire. During the Renaissance, Agrippa von Nettesheim, reluctant to accept the idea that the stars were related to the earthly fauna, modified Plato's statement. Agrippa, basing his opinion on Aristotle, Discorides, and Pliny the Elder, said that fire shelters salamanders and crickets. A simple experiment would have proven that salamanders and crickets die in fire, like any other animal, but Agrippa shared with the past an aversion to experimentation. From Pliny we learn that similar beliefs concerning the marvelous virtues of salamanders existed in Egypt and Babylon. Without doubt, Aristotle had gathered his wisdom from oriental neighbors, and did not find it necessary to submit the salamander to a scientific test. Thus did a superstitious belief perpetuate itself for about 2,000 years. That the fiery nature of the salamander was accepted generally in Agrippa's time is illustrated by the fact that his contemporary, Francis I of France, adopted as his royal emblem the Batrachian surrounded by flames. The reasoning of the philosophers produced the most startling and poetic absurdities. Plato says that the head, the abode of ideas, is spherical in the image of the stars. Unlike the rest of the body, the head is linked to heaven. A small isthmus, the neck, between the intelligible and the corporeal, was made in order to separate neatly these two things. Plato's world is a magical one, for it is unified and all things are interrelated. The universe is an animal endowed with soul and mind. It has no eyes, as nothing is said to be beyond it. It has no ears, for there is no place outside of it in which anything could be heard. It has no breath, as the atmosphere is within it. Hands are useless to the world animal, as it has no enemy against whom it would use them. It has no feet, for they are not necessary to revolving movement, etc. Thus the world animal is shaped in the most perfect form, the sphere. The soul is older than the body and therefore superior to it, says Plato. It is composed of three elements, the indivisible, which partakes of the divine, and the divisible, which partakes of the earthly. Both are related through a third element partaking of each and placed between the two. The three were made one by compression. The compound was cut into strips which were crossed or interwoven and bent into a spherical shape. Such was the world soul in which God has placed the corporeal universe. The human soul is made of the same elements as the world soul. The star gods are the children of the Creator. They form man who will return after death to his star. The world soul pervades everything. In man, it circulates in a proper motion, which can be perfected by him who observes the motion of the heavenly gods, the planets. Plato believed in the influence of the stars. He is cited frequently by the astrologers of the 16th and 17th centuries. Moreover, he gave an impetus to alchemy when placing the world soul in all bodies. The alchemists were striving to extract the soul of substances. Using this essence, they wanted to produce marvelous effects with minerals. Just as the Persian Zoroaster believed that the good god Ormazd shaped the world with ideas, similarly Plato attributed the divine character to ideas. Since they dominate the body, the magicians of the West concluded that they could induce marvels in the corporeal world through the omnipotence of sovereign ideas. Since in Plato's world, heaven and earth, 
The elements, the soul and the spirit, the divine and the terrestrial, are interrelated and partake of one another, it is no wonder that magicians wanted to make use of such mysterious consanguinity. Similarly, they used Pythagorean numbers in their magic circles, as numbers were also, according to Pythagoras, older than bodies and hence more powerful. The world is formed according to a mathematical scheme and is harmonized according to proportion. Beauty and order were to these philosophers impossible to achieve without numbers. In the size, weight, and intervals of the stars lurk mystic numbers, and around these the Creator built the cosmos. The Pythagoreans called arithmetic the study of numbers and their relation to natural phenomena, so that scientific study was fused with philosophic speculations and fantasy. When the Pythagoreans became inebriated with their own imagination, arithmetic was lost in the marvelous, and numbers became living beings, divine hypostases in their own right. At times the number four answered to Hermes and Dionysus. Seven, one of the oldest number divinities, was Pallas Athene. Ten represented Atlas, who upholds the vault of the sky. According to the poet Hesiod, Chaos, of, or the primeval mass, whence all things were formed, found its embodiment in the monad, the number one. Five was the number of justice, uniting the feminine number two with the masculine three. Six was Aphrodite, goddess of love, as this number was composed of two times three, the multiplied first numbers of each sex. Plutarch, as we have noted, has a different interpretation for the numbers three, four, and five, and we may suppose that more than once in the course of time the meaning of numbers has changed. The Pythagoreans were not only theorists of magic, but they practiced it publicly. Empedocles performed wonders among the people. He believed firmly that he could resuscitate the dead, induce rain and drought, etc. The magical beliefs of old which had enriched people's lives were clothed by the philosophers in the beautiful garments of reason. Most philosophers, however, like the members of all classes, indulged also in popular magic or superstitions. Thales believed in demoniacal apparitions, and Plato in ghosts, deceased people who were compelled to return to the living because they were unable to dissociate themselves from their bodily passions. Democritus, who could laugh so heartily at human folly, recommended that a man stung by a scorpion should sit upon an ass and whisper in the animal's ear. A scorpion has stung me. He thought that the pain would thus be transferred to the ass. All the philosophers of old believed in the reality of magic. Heraclitus, Thales, Pindar, Xenophon, Socrates were unable to elude the enchanted circle. The later Greek philosophers, like Porphyry, were entirely devoted to magical practices. They have bequeathed their elaborate demonology to the early Christians, whom they had fought so bitterly. For Porphyry there existed innumerable beastly demons who haunted men in houses in their hankering after blood and filth. At mealtimes the demons swarm around us like flies, and only a complicated ritual can keep them away. These ceremonies were initiated not to please the gods, but solely to repel devils. Greek magic has been influenced from time immemorial by Oriental beliefs. No nation welcomed foreign ideologies more warmly than the Hellenes. Priests, philosophers, and historians roamed foreign lands. The quest for knowledge led the wonder worker Apollonius of Tyana to the shores of India. Plato tells of cultural ties with Egypt and Crete. Greeks accompanied the Persians Darius and Xerxes on their expeditions. They admired the wisdom of the Persians. In the Alcibiades, Plato causes Socrates to say that their educators are superior to those in Athens, and he speaks admiringly of the brilliant tutelage given to the young Persian princes and the virtues of their teachers, the wisest of whom is Imagian, a disciple of Zoroaster. Mythical figures and gods of the Orient have been Hellenized. The Delphic cult originated in Crete. Adonis sprang from the Hebrew Adonai. Aphrodite is the embellished and pacified Astarte. Isis became Athene, and Dionysus hardly veils his alien origin. Like the wise men of the Orient, the Hellenic philosophers were believed by the people to be magicians. It was commonly accepted that Socrates possessed a familiar spirit that kept him informed of the future. 
According to Socrates' friend, Xenophon, many of the philosopher's confidants would consult the spirit about their own problems. Plutarch says that the familiar replied with sneezes directed either to the right or left, according to whether the answers were affirmative or negative. Apuleius says that Socrates' demon was visible to all, an opinion which Maximus of Tyre disputed vigorously. The latter asserted that it nearly symbolized Socrates' psychic power. This controversy as to the appearance and character of his demon continued into the 18th century. In an essay on the demon of divination of Socrates, the author, Nares, arrives at the disappointing conclusion that Socrates employed the word demon merely to describe his divinatory gift. Nares decides reasonably that despite the, their wisdom, the Greek philosophers were after all only children of their time, and like lesser men subject to the beliefs and prejudices of their fathers.